Hi everyone, welcome to my talk. Oh uh, yeah, Anubi's take on mobile dangers through the looking glass, which is a bit of a mouthful to say, I must admit. Um, a little bit of background about how this talk came about. I went to security a few months ago with a colleague and um, I met, I bumped into Andy and David and we started talking about B-sides and possibly doing a talk. Um, and I said to them I wanted to do a talk after my dissertation. But after a few beers, they did persuade me to do this talk now. So Andy, my mentor, yeah, helped me out quite a bit with this. So a quick run through of what my talk's going to be about. These are a few points that I've expanded on a little bit. Um, it's quite a steep learning curve because I didn't really have a talk before. So once I got accepted, started working on it quite a lot and uh, yeah, it was a steep learning curve for this. But first thing I wanted to look at was why do people actually root their devices? And there are quite a lot of positives. Initially, I thought it was a bad thing. I thought people like, if you've rooted your device, you're opening yourself up to a lot of vulnerabilities. But actually, you can um, you can definitely make your... Like, how do I explain it? So you, you can increase the privacy. You can get rid of a lot of the bloatware on your device and you can install cool themes and third-party apps if you want to do that. I mean, how many of you in the audience has uh, an Android device? Cool. How many of you have rooted your Android device? So a lot of you probably knew what you were doing when you were rooting your device, especially here. But some people, they don't necessarily know what they're doing and they could just be installing custom themes and new ROMs and you can do cool things with it, but you could also open up your talk to possibly, you could uh, open up your talk. You could possibly brick your device, which I did experience firsthand when I was testing things. And uh, also you can see that some of the apps won't work because in case you install a third party app, it could be a malware and um, you could open your, your device up to multiple vulnerabilities in that sense. Um, so first I looked at how you actually read your device. So there are two ways I found so far. There were, one is a manual, a manual way, and then I saw that you can install apps when you were rooting your device. So when I went to root my device, device I had a Samsung J3, like a really rubbish little device. I didn't want to do it on my own phone. I, I tried to install Kingo root and one click, um, and one click root. The one click root you had to pay for. The Kingo root, it didn't actually work on my device, and I wanted to see how you'd be able to root your device manually anyway. So I gave it a try. And I installed Twerp, a uh, recovery image. So when I went to root it, I went into fast boot mode and um, inst inst installed the uh, recovery image. And then I ended up going through and uh, installing the binary. So I use SuperSuit, although Majesca is more of a newer version um, that people use. I went into recovery mode, installed that binary, and basically... Installing the super user binary can then enable you to grant privileges to your applications. And you could do cool things like customize your firmware on your device or anything like that. I thought it was really interesting, actually. Before I did the talk, I thought, ah, oh, it could be, it could be a danger, obviously. And I've changed my mind a lot in the sense that if you know what you're doing, you could do some really cool things. You can improve the battery life of your device and things like that. So, I had a look at that. First thing first, I set up my lab, really quickly run through. It started off on the floor, like I didn't really know what I was doing. I had a Pi, Pi Zero, which had terrible processing power. Um, so I changed it to a Pi 3B Plus and uh, worked a lot better. Uh, just a quick setup. I mean, I had a Pi Zero had one USB port and I was plugging my mouse, taking it out, plugging in my keyboard, taking it out. And I plugged my phone in and I was like, oh, I can't actually run any commands on my phone because for, for my phone and connect it because I actually didn't have enough USB ports. So I had a USB port splitter and bought that. Um, and the whole idea behind this talk was the fact that I've been seeing a lot of these USB ports around, charging USB ports on like planes and uh, buses and whatnot. And I was thinking this is a possible attack vector here because if you plug your device into this random USB port, you don't necessarily know what's going to happen. So the whole idea behind this was programmatically rooting your device. And I did feel a lot like this when I started looking into it because it, there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons why you can't, and security is actually quite high on your devices. So. For example, when you plug your device in, it's a USB, there's USB debugging, like a pop-up on the screen that comes up. Um, you have to physically root your device as well, with press buttons and manual buttons and whatnot. And um, yeah, human, human input is needed. So if you do have a pop-up, you have to press OK and whatnot. And I was like, oh, that's, that's an issue. So I've decided to try and find ideas to work around that. Um, but first, I wanted to see what you could do when you plug your device into a USB port when it's not rooted, some issues. So there's a quick disclaimer here is that if you plug your device into a USB port, charging port, um, if a Pi was behind this uh, port, then what could happen? And I played around with UDEV rules that interact with the kernel, detect when a device is plugged in, 
I've created a shell script um, to kick off screen recording, which is quite a cool thing. So if you do ADB shell, you can screen record your device, but it's quite a few ifs and buts. So with the code that I wrote, um, here you can see the vendor ID detects the device um, and kicks off the Pi script. You have to have a like, specific vendor ID for it to kick off in the background. And it's a very simple code. And there's a lot I want to develop on from this, but it basically records the screen and you can capture it. So maximum is about three minutes, but you could possibly capture passwords and you can see that's showing up there. And you could also see emails or sensitive documents. And I thought that was quite interesting, quite a little like idea that if you did plug that device in, you don't know what's happening because the user doesn't see it necessarily. But you have to make sure that the device is unlocked and um, the USB debug is enabled for this to actually work. But one of the issues, because the USB debugging pop-up came up, I was thinking, what's a good way to work around that? So I had to play around with a DigiSpark <laughs> device, and I went through about five of them, because a lot of them broke. But you can automate the keyboard on the device, or pretend like it's a human interface device, and automate some of the steps. So here I've just got a quick GIF of uh, the code working there on the side, and you can see it switching and pressing OK. And if this developed a little bit further, you'd be able to kind of cancel out the pop-outs, because imagine if you've plugged your device into this USB port, this runs and it's just sending the codes and you could automate a lot of this, right? And the Pi could be sending code out as well. And you could also, you could also uh, crack passwords, but it'd take a really long time and I didn't really try it, but it's something I'd like to develop at the same time. Um, so initially I had a look at third-party apps as well, because that was one of the issues behind it, and uh, there was one called a fake Snapchat app that I looked into, and if you were someone like your grandma, for example, and they had a phone and they installed a, uh, this app, this app could possibly, um, with the permissions, scope out the network and also steal the credentials, and it used to be in the Google Play Store, it's taken down now, but it's so easy, because this is a newbie's talk, you could just download the APK file, and you could uh, install it on a device, although it's a device as well. So... Being the newbie that I am, I decided to try and create an APK file using EasySploit, which is basically investing the MSF console and MeshSploit. And uh, I had a look at trying to install that onto my device. Um, so I used the ADB Android Debugging Bridge to automate the install on the back with the uh, with my Pi when you plug it in. And uh, the, when, I, when I plugged it in, I actually lost the APK file. I don't know how, and I checked it, I tried to uninstall it, wouldn't uninstall, I tried to install it, it was saying it was already installed, so I don't quite know what happened there, but that was one of the uh, things I think, if you managed to install it and kick it off, then it would run in the background, and uh, you'd be able to exploit it and create a reverse TCP connection with the payload, so if you imagine you've plugged your device in, and you can um, install that APK file, and they might click on it through some social engineering, or possibly an intent. I saw, I had a look, little look into the intents. I don't fully understand them, but these can kick off in the background if you run the ADB shell command. Um, if you automated that for a bash script when it's plugged in and the UDEV rule kicked off, that you'd be able to create this reverse TCP connection, TCP connection to the Pi, and then from that, SSH, so you could be like a hacker in a cafe or something, SSH into the Pi that's hidden and disguised, and then you'd be able to access all these files on this rooted device, for example, that's been plugged in, and no one would really be none the wiser. Otherwise, you'd have to make sure that you've um, unlocked the device again and uh, plugged it in and got rid of all the pop-ups. So because the install of the APK file didn't fully work out too well, I was like, well, how, what is this APK file actually doing in the background? So I used APK tool just to pull out some of the files of the uh, APK that had been generated in the MSF console. So I wanted to see how it was working. And basically had all these permissions. And if someone installed this APK file and started clicking yes and granted all these permissions, you basically had a bug on your phone. House. This is really interesting. It's something I really want to look into as well. So it's, it's a lot of ideas because I really wanted to do this for my dissertation. But um, yeah, so you've got all these submissions and I also had to play around with the Smiley files and this tool called Dex2Jar. So I had a look in that, ran Dex2Jar and like opened up some of the Smiley files so I could read them in Java. Um, didn't get too far with that, definitely will have a look at that in the future. A few quick mentions that I wanted to say was there's a lot of cool things already out there in terms of just destroying a device, I guess. So you've got the USB killer. This short circuit says it's just like DDoSes your phone and kills it completely. So imagine if you're a businessman or whatever and you plugged your device into this USB port and it kills your phone. That's basically your, basically your life because a lot of people have phones these days. And it's Frida as well. I'm pretty sure there was a talk on that earlier. And if you've rooted your device, for example, and you've installed Frida and you've used it to pretend that you're not root, 
then um, you can uh, install a third-party malicious app, and that will get all the access as well, and break out the sandbox environment and cause a bit of damage. So Frida could be good at that. And ISI catches are quite interesting, but I won't go into it too much depending on the time. Um, yeah, so I wanted to mention iOS because I didn't play around with it. It's a bit of a gray area because it's closed sourced. I didn't look into the vulnerabilities of it. However, there's an exploit database for this um, you can find online. I've got, I'm pretty sure there's a link in my description, so I'll have to, you can come and talk to me about it if you want. Um, but yeah, it's not just Android devices that are vulnerable. And part of the future is I do want to look into this a bit further, and I'd love to do like a 2.0 talk or something that I've actually like researched into a lot because I didn't have too much time to research into this one. Um, so I'm interested in mobile malware and researching into that, and I love the automation size behind it. So the whole idea of this was automating the exploits when you plug your device into the Pi. So I'd like to work on that a little bit. But yeah, that's pretty much the talk. So if you have any questions, because it might not have been so clear, because I'm a little bit nervous of talking up here, please ask away, because I could probably explain better in a conversation on this talk. Yeah. The guy all the way in the back. Yeah, yeah use the microphone. Probably creating the DigiSpark device. I, it looks it's such a small slide, but I spent days just trying to get this automation to work. So I plugged this keyboard into my phone and started pressing the keys, and I found trying to automate these steps actually the best because you can see it working as soon as you plugged it in, and it's, it's so satisfying when you actually manage to get something like that working. And I'd love to develop it so you could create a bad USB with these DigiSparks. Just plug it in and imagine what you could do with your phone then. Yeah, so that's, that was probably one of the most fun things. Other questions? Remember the old days when ADB was the assembler debugger? Jeez. <laughs> no, never mind. Sorry. Comments? Thoughts? Yeah, Is that a question? He raised any, his I, hand, I swear. He did. Yeah. Okay. If any of you do have any questions, or if you've worked on like mobile security, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, because it, as you can see, it's a very, like, uh, a lot of ideas, and I've still got a long way to go with this, so please just like come and approach me, because I'm really open to learning more about it. Yeah, so... Anyone. So the USB device you showed up, the little thing, was that actually like a rubber ducky or something equivalent? So I, I got these uh, DigiSpark devices. They're like knockoff Arduinos. And I, I bought a load of them. And a lot of them just didn't work because they just poorly They were made. knockoffs, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I got the idea of a bad USB. Like I had the idea of a bad USB and I wanted to try and create something and I was playing around with the code. And initially, because I've got two experiences, I wanted to pull files off the device and then move them onto a USB stick, which wasn't really possible or I haven't managed to get working. But um, I did just end up using it to send commands to the phone and it literally worked straight away. So I'm not. <sighs> Gabe, hiding in the back. I need another 10,000 steps today. <coughs> Just walk up and down the plane when you fly home. Um, talking about the requirement to have the device ID, did you do anything with uh, attempting to automatically identify the device to grab the device ID from, say, a database or something? Is that something you've looked at as possible? No, I didn't. It could definitely be possible. In my head, I thought if it was actually going to become a working sort of expert, because it doesn't technically work. It works when I was testing, but it's obviously not in practice. Having a load of UDEV rules, but I initially looked, I spent a lot of time looking at GVFS and the, where it was mounted and seeing if I could automate anything like that. Um, so when it's plugged in, if it detects a device, like I, I don't know. I don't know. Possibly I could definitely look into working on that. I was thinking a lot of vendor IDs, but it's, it's hard because it's very specific to one device, whereas there are different types of devices out there, and there's different ways of routing the devices, and it's it's very varied. So, yeah, it'd be something I'd want to look into, for sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. The youth of this interacts with the kernel, so the kernel then submits, sends the commands, and it's got a list of that, and it interprets it, and it, it can end the it's pretty good. Cool. Pardon? Say that again. Oh, so yeah, it basically with the U devils, it like it has. I can't remember. This. It's not. It's not really a listener. I guess it's technically a listener, and it talks to the kernel, and the kernel is then send the commands through. And it, yeah, it, it detects the device that way. So when I was testing it, I ran LS USB to find out what the vendor ID was and the product ID, and then worked it that way. And originally, I was thinking you'd have to use the vendor ID and the product ID in the rules file to be able to kick anything off, but actually, you could limit it to the vendor ID. And when I was, te it, it was sketchy when I was testing it, because you, you had to have it unlocked, and then um, also USB debugging enabled. I was testing it, and uh, I managed to get it to kick off the shell script to bring up a browser, so I knew that it was working. And I was actually doing it. So yeah, that was basically I do have that. Probably sidetracked a little bit there. 
Any questions? Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>